I hope that you will turn with me in a Bible to Isaiah, prophet Isaiah, chapter 9, and we will be reading together verses 1 to 7, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 to 7. And in these verses, we see a vivid description of the greatest gift ever given. The greatest gift ever given. So let's read it together, beginning at verse 1. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have scattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, every warrior's boot used in battle, and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The greatest gift ever given. And we could spend days walking through these verses, unpacking line by line all the glory contained therein. Every description given of this gift, the gift of the Messiah, the gift of King David, of the one who will reign on King David's throne, King Jesus. So full of joy, so full of blessing and hope. This light that has broken into the darkness of this world. This joy that never ceases to increase. This peace, this liberation from oppression. This one who is a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. And we could apply every single one of these descriptions In part to King David, yes, but in fullness to King Jesus, the one who reigns on David's throne. So much helpfulness, so much glory. But for today, what I want to emphasize is that when this prophecy was originally given, It took place during the reign of King Ahaz of Judah, which means that it was given at least 700 years before the arrival of King Jesus. 700 years. And from our standpoint now, in this year of our Lord, 2021, We can see the immediacy of this. Of course, Christ is born. Of course, the gift has been given. But if we neglect the distance of that time, 
we will forget how God works. We will forget that God is patient, that he is long-suffering, that he accomplishes his purposes in his own time, not ours. We want it now. We need a Messiah. We need a Savior. We need the perfect kingdom, the perfect government. We need it now. So send it now. But that's not God's way. And as we read these verses now, we're struck by how, yes, because Jesus has been born, because we can celebrate Christmas, because he is our wonderful counselor, he is the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, we can say, okay, well, that's been given. But now we're entering yet another year of our Lord, the year 2022. It's a big and scary number, filled with all kinds of uncertainties. And we're struck by, well, so much of this has yet to be fulfilled. And now we are 2,000 years removed from the birth of Christ. And we have to remember, it's about God's timing. It's about God's purposes. But we can't help but long for this ever-increasing joy, this peace, this worldwide end to bloodshed. We long for this day, we should long for this day, when every warrior's boot used in battle, every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. When? How long, O Lord? This is where I want to bear down on the very end of verse 7. How does this come about? It comes about in God's own timing, of course. If he wants to take 700 years, if he wants to take 2,000 years, if he wants to take 10,000 years, God is sovereign and free enough to do that. But how does it happen? The zeal of the Lord Almighty, that is, the zeal of the Lord of hosts, the Lord of heavenly armies, will accomplish this. What will accomplish it? The zeal, the passion of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Is it my zeal? Your zeal? The world's zeal? No. It is the zeal of the Lord Almighty who sent His one and only Son to be born in a manger. Not in a palace in a manger, to be greeted by throngs of the world's greatest and brightest and richest, no, by shepherds. That's the zeal of the Lord Almighty. That's the zeal that we can count on today. And the great encouragement I want to bring you today is that if the Lord Almighty, if the Lord of hosts can establish this eternal kingdom by sending His Son to be born in a manger, an animal trough, then nothing is too hard for Him. If His zeal can accomplish that, if His zeal can establish this kingdom that will have no end, if He can send this One who is wonderful Counselor, mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, by sending him to be born in a manger, then truly his zeal can accomplish anything. So the question is do we believe that? Are we living like the zeal of the Lord Almighty can accomplish that? Or it's kind of a nice thought, it's wishful thinking. Want to believe it, maybe? But we can't really stake everything on that. We can't put all our chips. In this basket, can we? And of course, that's what many have done. It's been 2,000 years, and he hasn't come back. I think it's time to move on. That is the thinking. That is the mindset of so many and so much around us. It's time to move on. We can't count on him. This is, this is thinking that is disconnected from real life. 
And if there is a God, he's certainly not a God of passion and zeal. He's a God who stands back and observes. No, we need to recover the glory and the beauty and the truthfulness of the zeal of the Lord Almighty. Especially in our hearts. To believe, to reaffirm our conviction that He establishes this kingdom. He builds. Not me, not you. And that is great news. That is great news. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And to understand the zeal of the Lord Almighty, just consider how there is eternal planning that stands behind the zeal of the Lord Almighty. In other words, God is not a last-minute shopper. Unlike the stereotypical husband who's scrambling before Christmas to pick out the perfect gift, who's at a total loss as to what to get, and I've been one of them, I freely confess, that's not God. That's not God. God from eternity, from eternity, before there was anything or anyone, sovereignly purposed to not only create a people for himself, but to redeem a people for himself. To show his glory across the universe. And this is why in, for example, Revelation 13, 8, Jesus is described as the Lamb who was slain from the foundations of the world. From the foundations of the world. Before he even arrived on the scene, before he entered time and space to be born as one of us, to assume human nature for us and for our salvation, before Anyone had even heard the name of Jesus. And certainly before he went to the cross to be crucified in place of sinners, God purposed this. The zeal of the Lord Almighty planned this. And you can determine someone's real passion, their enthusiasm or zeal, based on how long have you been planning this? And how were you at carrying it out? Maybe you had a big plan. You wanted to do the right thing. Your heart was in the right place, but the follow-through, eh, not so much. Not so with the Lord of hosts. Not so with the Lord Almighty. There is eternal planning that stands behind the establishment of this throne and this kingdom. The perfect king reigning on the perfect throne. Reigning across a perfect kingdom. God knows how to give the perfect gift in the perfect way for the most imperfect of people, sinners like you and like me. He didn't decide, oh, Dane Hadley has been such a good boy this year. <laughs> He's so worthy. How can I really treat him? How can I honor him? No. No. For people who are rotten, for people who rebel against him, who, who want to throw off the shackles of his rule. People who say in their hearts, we can do better than this. We can do better than God. We don't need him. We don't need his rules. He's just a killjoy. Throw that off. Throw it overboard. Let's move forward. We can do better for ourselves. That is the pride that lurks in your heart and lurks in my heart. And yet, God so loved the world that He sent His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him, not so ever who lives a perfect life, who's an upstanding citizen, who earns the respect of their neighbors and their family, who's the poster child for the good life. No, whoever believes in Him might have everlasting life and not perish eternally as we all deserve. 
Do you appreciate, do, are you gripped by the eternal planning that stands behind the zeal of the Lord Almighty? Eternal planning. That should blow our minds. And it should make us feel so small when we put so much stock in our plans. Consider these words from James chapter 4, verse 13. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. And to paraphrase, those of you who say, this is what we're going to do in 2022. Here's how it's going to be different. Here's my vision. Here's my plan for 2022. Listen, you. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. Not just misguided, evil. Oh, but we love our plans. If we could just work up enough enthusiasm, if we could just be zealous enough, passionate enough, we could do it. It's boasting. It's boasting. If it is God's will, if it is according to His purposes, according to the zeal of God's heart, is the desire of your heart to be in full alignment with God's heart? Do you want to be zealous about what God is zealous about? We can all be enthusiastic about something. We can all get into something. But the Lord Almighty is all in for glorifying His one and only Son. God is is jealous for his glory. Repeatedly he says, especially in Isaiah, I myself will do it for my own sake, for my glory. The highest good in the universe, the glory of God. He will share his glory with no one. But because of King Jesus, we can put a sharper point on the glory of God. His glory is aimed at exalting his one and only Son. And so in in addition to the eternal planning that stands behind the zeal of the Lord Almighty, we need to see the burning passion that stands behind the zeal of the Lord Almighty. His burning passion to exalt His one and only Son. Now, to catch just a glimpse of this, consider the heartbreak the unfathomable heartbreak of a parent who's lost a child. No matter of what age. And consider how so often what parents want to do in view of losing a beloved child is to not let their child have died in vain. So so often foundations, charitable trusts, are established in memory of a beloved child to further, for example, research into whatever disease afflicted that child or or whatever cause led to that child's death. We don't want our children to die, period, but if they do, we don't want them to die in vain. We want to honor their memory somehow. And that is a beautiful, beautiful thing. When you think about that, That's just a taste, just a glimmer of the burning passion of God the Father to not allow His Son's blood to be shed in vain. God the Father looks upon the sacrifice of His Son, the lowliness of His Son, the Son who was willingly humiliated to be born in a manger, to be dismissed by the world, to be born in the midst of scandal. His mother is pregnant with him before she's married. And no one else will understand it. They can't. 
Those are the circumstances in which the Lord Jesus was born. And not only that, when he preaches the truth, when he heals, when he shows God's heart for hurting and sinful people, does he earn the applause of the people around him? No. Far from it. He earns so much disdain, and by the end, everyone has left him. Even his closest disciples. So that by the end, he is hanging naked in the place of a criminal, rejected, despised, all for something that sinful people could never fully understand. To reconcile God the Father to sinners like you and me. To be our peace. To shed His blood in your place and my place. And is the Father going to be disinterested in view of that? And look on? Good job, Jesus. Or give Him an applause. No! The zeal of the Lord Almighty raises Him from the dead. Exalts Him to His right hand. Announces him to be the judge of the living and the dead. Your judge and mine. Gives fair warning to one and all that there will be a day. A day that grows closer by the hour when he will return to judge the world. And when this kingdom described here in Isaiah 9 will cover the world as the waters and the sea. The burning passion of the Father. Is that your view of God? Now, it's true that God is, to use an academic word, impassable. God is pure spirit. The divine nature is without body, parts, or passions. And what that means is that God isn't subject to mood swings, unlike you and unlike me. God doesn't get angry when he's hungry. He doesn't get hangry. He's not subject to hormonal imbalances like we all are. No. God does have emotion. He does have feeling. But it is perfect. He is only angry at the things that are worth getting angry about. His anger is restrained. His wrath is pure and holy and good. His purposes, His ways are all righteous. His love, His mercy, His compassion, His heart that beats for His people to redeem them, to find them wherever they are. It's real. So if your view of God is this disinterested old man up in the sky somewhere just looking on, maybe waiting to throw a thunderbolt whenever you mess up. No, get rid of that altogether. This is a God of zeal, of passion, of desire. And it's good. It's good. It's so much better than anything you will find in yourself or anything you will find in the world. Do you know the God of this zeal? Are you trusting in His zeal? to accomplish his purposes, to build his kingdom. Because in view of this burning passion, we can see unstoppable momentum. Unstoppable momentum. It's momentum that we need to rely on, to depend on. And herein lies a rebuke for all of us, especially for those who claim to be part of the church. We are so prone to forget, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders build in vain, aren't we? Because our tendency, your tendency, my tendency, is to make plans, to try to work up enough enthusiasm. If we could just get the people in the church to be more passionate, more enthusiastic, then we could accomplish things. 
if we could just plan the perfect worship service. But you, you and I both know, we all fall prey to the, the temptation to become like film critics. We show up on the Lord's Day in the Lord's house, and we say, well, you know, I give that sermon about a maybe three and a half. Didn't quite do it for me this Sunday. Or, or we hear the music, and we say, ah, I wish I could hear more of that instrument. Or maybe I'm hearing a little too much of that instrument. You know, it was just too fast this Sunday. Just too fast. Or it's just too slow. I just couldn't get into it. You know you've talked that way. We all have. So I, I give, give that a, a two stars. Oh, that church, though, man, their Christmas program, that was a five star. Wish we had that kind of program here. Oh. A rebuke. Such a rebuke. Does it say that your showmanship will accomplish this? No! Does it say whoever has the most savvy and slick digital engagement will accomplish this? No. Whoever has the most people show up for the Christmas program and those of you who have been around Tabernacle for any amount of time, you have fond memories of the living Christmas tree, right? And it was great. I'm, I'm thankful that I got to experience it. But does it say that if we could just bring back the living Christmas tree, the people would come back and the Lord would accomplish it? No! No! How does this kingdom get built? The zeal of the Lord Almighty, the Lord of heavenly hosts, of heavenly armies, He can and He will accomplish this. He will build His kingdom. It's not up to me. It's not up to you. And praise God, it's not. Praise God, it's not up to us. Because we couldn't do it. No, this is a God who sends His Son to be born in a manger. This is a God who says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. I will bring to nothing the things that people pride themselves in, that they glory in, that they boast in. I'll bring them to nothing. I'll smash them with a hammer. They'll count for nothing in the end. All the things that they glory in. No. At the end, the glory, the spotlight will be squarely on the Lord Jesus Christ. It will be about Him. Unstoppable momentum. Are you swept up into this unstoppable momentum? Or are you saying, I think we could do better than that. I don't think, we can't just rely on the Word of God. We can't just lean on that. that that's not enough of a vision. I mean, come on. Come on. We need, we need a grand vision. We need a grand strategy. And hear me clearly. If, if we could get every denomination in the world to work together, if we could assemble the greatest and the most powerful missions organization and send it across the globe, if we could have the biggest budget we've ever known, the most beautiful building we've ever seen, it still couldn't accomplish this. Why? Because what needs to be accomplished in order to build this kingdom is to change one sinful heart at a time. And that power is not in me, and it's not in you. That prerogative lies solely and exclusively with the zeal of the Lord Almighty. He and He alone will accomplish this. So we need to hear this rebuke, but also hear this, this comfort, deep and abiding comfort. When we face setbacks and we think, God, where are you? And we're tempted to pray as we hear in Isaiah chapter 63, using the same phrase, they pray, look down from heaven and see from your lofty throne, holy and gracious, where are your zeal and your might, your tenderness and compassion are withheld from us. We pray like that sometimes, and we can pray like that. God, where are you? Save! You alone can save, please! God, answers that kind of prayer, that kind of prayer desperation. But we need to be prepared. That's going to happen. We're going to think, where is this zeal? Where is this power? I love the story of 
General Ulysses S. Grant at the Battle of Shiloh. It was April 1862. In the midst of the bloodiest battle up to that point in the Civil War. On the first day of the battle, the Union Army was completely routed. They were caught unawares. They're having breakfast. And the Confederate Army is breaking into their camp. And they can do nothing but run as fast as they can. All on the west banks of the Tennessee River. Grant arrives late in the day to try to stop the route as much as he can. But the troops under the command of General William Tecumseh Sherman were on the whole beaten badly. And so by the end of the day, the Union Army found itself completely surrounded. They have the river on one side, there's nowhere to go, and they're surrounded by the Confederate Army on the other side. And one of the Confederate commanders, General Beauregard, wrote a telegram to the Confederate president, Jefferson Davis, to say, victory is certain. And he said, I have Grant exactly where I want him. I'll finish him in the morning. Well, both armies passed a miserable night that night due to torrential downpour. The rain was pouring down, and it was especially severe for the Union Army because so much of their gear, so much of their, their tent and camp equipment had been lost. But a little after midnight, Sherman spotted Grant, standing alone, smoking a cigar underneath a tree, trying to get out of the rain. And he goes up to him and he says, well, Grant... We've had the devil's own day, haven't we? And probably some other language that wouldn't be appropriate for the pulpit. Grant takes a puff on his cigar, and he says, yep, lick him in the morning, though. Lick him in the morning, though. And sure enough, at the crack of dawn, the Union Army launched an attack not on the right flank, left flank, but from the center, but all across the line. They launched a ferocious counterattack and sent the enemy running. And that has to be our attitude about the kingdom of God sometimes. When we feel defeated and we feel down and we wonder, where is God? What are you doing? We need to remember that this is a God who is all in He is fully committed. His zeal, his passion, his enthusiasm, his desire, his heart is behind this unstoppable momentum. He will win. There will come a day. We don't know when, but we know that with every passing minute, it's getting closer and closer when Jesus will return and every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And by the work of His Spirit, you can have something of the power of this zeal within you. I hope you're an enthusiastic person. I I hope there's something you're passionate about. But above all, I pray that you are all in for what God is all in to do. That you are all in for His one and only Son, Jesus. That you are sold out for Him. That you are zealous and enthusiastic about Him. I pray that at the mention of Jesus' name, there's something that rises in your heart. and You can't keep it down. You can't contain it. Because you know what he's done for you. And you know that there is a God, a Father who sent him and who will not allow his blood to have been shed in vain. And that he will find every single one of his lost sheep. He will find the one. Even if he leaves the 99 behind. And maybe you're that one today. Maybe you're not enthusiastic about anything. Maybe you don't know the zeal of the Lord. I pray that by the work of the Holy Spirit, 
You would be revived and awakened to know this zeal. A zeal that burns. That cannot be snuffed out. That will last until the end. Until glory. Until this kingdom, this perfect, righteous, holy, and just kingdom is established throughout the earth when there is a new heaven and a new earth. Until then, may we wait patiently and hopefully and may we count on the zeal of the Lord to accomplish it. Not ourselves, not our own cleverness, not our own plans, not our own wisdom. We can't do it. But by his power, working in and through common, ordinary people like you and me, sinful, prideful people, he will build his kingdom. May you be a part of it as we go to him in prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you that enthusiasm and zeal is not something that we have to manufacture. It's not something that that we have to try to put on so that we can achieve the perfect feeling in a worship service. Lord, I praise you and I thank you that even if my preaching is a complete and utter failure, your zeal for your glory for the name of Jesus, will burn just as brightly. But I pray, Lord, by the work of your Holy Spirit, that you would be pleased to use me, to use this church, to use us for your glory. That you would be magnified through the labor, through the ministry, through the programming, through the efforts of this local body of believers. And I ask, Lord, that as we move into this coming year, as we approach a time of uncertainty, as we battle the the worries and the doubts and the anxieties we feel within us, that we would be able to receive and to rest on what Jesus has done for us. And that our joy, the passion of our lives, would not be ourselves, our plans, our abilities, but that our zeal would be your zeal, that our hearts and our lives would reflect your heart, that it would be said of me, it said of us, zeal for your house has consumed me. Lord, may it be all-consuming for us, all for your glory, all for our good, all by the power of your Holy Spirit. For We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.